Right, at 8.25, let's speak to Marion Jones, former Newsnight producer. His investigation into Savile was pulled by the then Newsnight editor, Peter Rippon, in December 2011. The extent of his crimes became apparent after an ITV expose months later. Hi, Marion. Hi, Nicky. So a key year here is 1973, isn't it? Yes, it is. I think what we get from the report is evidence that BBC bosses knew enough to stop Savile in 1973, and that's quite shocking. Uh, what it shows is that the controller of Radio 1 had two sets of information about what Savile was up to. He took it very seriously, put two senior executives on it. Uh, one he sent to go around the papers and check that the story was not going to break in the papers, and he appears to have been very relieved when he realised that they thought Savile was too popular to run the story. And then he got his deputy to interview Savile uh, about further allegations that Savile had been sleeping with underage girls in his hotel room. Uh, and Savile j admitted the fact that underage girls had stayed overnight in his hotel room, uh, but said that they'd just been there in sleeping bags, nothing untoward had happened. Uh, and again, they seemed to be very happy that he'd said that. Uh, so that it could all be put away. So instead of stopping Savile, and these are allegations that he was using his caravan, that he was going round for his Savile's Travels program uh, and sleeping with underage girls there, and also the hotel room, they put those to one side, and within two years, they give him the biggest children's TV program in history. Jim will fix it. There he is every week with a whole studio full of kids. Uh, and I think that is shameful, and I think it also shows that knowledge was there at very senior levels in the BBC and something should have been done. Not just a lack of joined-up thinking, but an actual dereliction of moral duty. I think that, and I think Dame Janet Smith has been very soft in her conclusions, if they remain as they are, uh, in saying that the BBC couldn't really have done anything about it. Mm. I think they could and should. Are those bosses still alive? About, I mean, Muggeridge, I think, was the controller, wasn't he, in 1973, from what I read. Are, there, are any of these people still alive to actually be held to account? He's dead, uh, so it's very difficult to hold individuals to account, but I think you can say that serious mistakes were made, that managers shouldn't behave like that in the future, uh, and, and to point the finger. Uh, and I think what it shows is knowledge at a very high level, and you get hints of that in all the evidence that was released during the Pollard inquiry, uh, of people in very senior levels, even recently in the BBC, hinting that there was a dark side to Savile, they knew stuff about him, uh, but nothing was done. Do you believe, uh, without obviously mentioning any names, but very recent very senior figures within the BBC, or even current senior figures in the BBC, knew about this? I think you'd get into semantics about the word no. I think very few people at senior levels wouldn't have known that there was something going on with Savile. Uh, the stories about Savile and young girls in particular were widespread in the BBC. Not everyone had heard them, but I think if you're at a senior level, they would have got through to you. Yes, I find it very difficult to believe. Uh, you know, all the way back in 1990, Lynn Barber wrote a piece in the Sunday Independent where she said every Fleet Street editor thinks Savile is a paedophile. You know, 2000, uh, Louis Theroux makes his film and those allegations are put. I don't think you could be unaware of that in a senior level, especially if you were appointing him and having him present the biggest show on BBC TV. Those were the days when uh, Fleet Street, uh, the News of the World, the People, the Sunday Mirror, all those newspapers were uh, voracious and uh, ruthless and pitiless in exposing celebrities who put a foot wrong. There were many people at the time saying, well, if there really was anything, he'd, he'd have been all over the front pages. What a story. Well, I know journalists uh, from that period... Uh, who did try to get him. Uh, mm. I've talked to people, uh, and they were blocked. Um, just as there was dereliction by the BBC, there was dereliction by the rest of the media. Uh, they were afraid to go after him. You know, he had a knighthood, he was round at checkers with the Prime Minister every New Year's Eve. Uh, he had a papal knighthood. 
Uh, he was in with the royal family. You know, he was Prince Charles's health advisor. It was very, very difficult to take all that on. Uh, but it just shows that we need the press to be braver. Uh, and it also shows that British libel laws allowed scandals like Savile to flourish. What did the great and the mighty see in him? He was their way to become instantly popular. You know, he had 20 million viewers. If you were Savile's friend, somehow you'd become a, you'd get the popular touch. You know, it's, it's like Harold Wilson giving the Beatles awards and so on. It, it's not because they, they particularly like or want that person. It's because they see it as a shortcut to become popular uh, people. What struck me is, uh, looking at this report and reading this uh, leaked report, this, uh, this draft version of it, uh, after there was an email that ran the BBC and there was, a, there was a clear desire for people to come forward to offer their thoughts on what Radio 1 was like and the BBC was like in the 70s and 80s if you worked there, so few people came forward to offer thoughts to the J Dame Janet Smith Review. Well, I, th I think it's very interesting that, obviously, the conclusions might change, but Dame Janet Smith seems to be suggesting that out of the hundred people who she listened to who knew something about Savile's offending, many of them wanted to be anonymous. Uh, they were afraid that they would be seen as attacking the BBC, that that fear is still there, that you shouldn't blow the whistle on things that happen in the BBC. And you're right, it's remarkable... People will tell you stuff uh, in back rooms and so on, but it's remarkable how few people were prepared to come forward. Just very quickly, it's been fascinating talking to you. Um, what about your own job? Why, have, why aren't you still working at the BBC? Uh, well, the people who are on my side of the argument uh, that wanted the Savile story out there uh, have been squeezed out. Uh, maybe I wasn't good enough at my job. Uh, who knows? But uh, it's more than a coincidence, I think, that all those people have been squeezed out. But the really terrible thing is that Karen Ward, uh, the woman who first came forward and did an interview with us and first went on camera and said that Savile was a prolific offender, that she has been let down by the BBC. So I'm more worried about those whistleblowers than I am about people like myself. I can take care of myself. Mm. Thank you very much, Marion. Marion Jones, former Newsnight producer. It's uh, 8.33 very nearly.